Welcome to today's episode of Transform Her, the show where we ignite audacity and break barriers, equipping African women with tangible resources and practical insights for their journey to the C-suites or as leaders in their entrepreneurial ventures. Together, we hope to usher in a new era of inclusive leadership that is bound to drive profound growth across the African continent. And your transformative guide, Ifoma Williams. On today's episode, we will be exploring the significance of history in building true leadership and entrepreneurship in Africa. Yes, there is definitely an intersection, a fascinating one, between history, leadership, and entrepreneurship. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back. Today's episode is aptly titled Femme Frontier, learning from Nigeria's historical narrative to uphold integrity in leadership and entrepreneurship in Nigeria and of course, Africa. And I have with me today a very special guest. She is a lawyer, a historian, and a producer, Ms. Adesua Gewa Osage. Welcome, Adesua. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Wow. I'm, Thank you. I'm just in awe of all you do. Adeswa is the producer of the Untold Stories with Adeswa and a Dirty Lie, or is it the Dirty the Lie? The Dirty Lie. The Dirty Lie podcast. So let's start from there. Yeah. Adeswa, what pivotal moments in your journey led to the production or starting, um, First of Untold Stories with Adeswa and the Dirty Lie podcast. Okay. So I studied history in university and I actually particularly studied the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. And I went to South Africa on a research trip. And while I was there, I learned a lot about Nigeria's actions in helping South Africans during the anti-apartheid movement. I learned that Thabo Mbeki lived in 1004. I learned that Nelson wow. Mandela was hidden in Nigeria by Mazubiki Amechi, a former minister of aviation. I also focused on the role of women in exile. So the women who were in the ANC and SNCC who were living in exile as combatants during the anti-apartheid movement. And for me, I realized that I would always want to highlight the stories of those women and those people who have the audacity to do something that nobody else has done before and who have changed our history and are not necessarily as widely known. Like I, I felt so ashamed that as a Nigerian woman, I knew more about Anne Boleyn than Hajia Saaba. You know, no, I, I, and for me, it's these persons and these personalities who in their lives, their philosophies, their relationships have helped shape nations. Mm -hmm. um, and they're often not spoken about. They're not widely known. And for me, it's the issue is not just that they're not known or not celebrated. It's also that their lives highlight the importance of being audacious or being authentic and also teach us that how things are, are not how they have always been mm -hmm. and are not necessarily how they have to be in the future. Thank you so much for that. So what I hear you say is that it is important. You know, the saying goes, if mm. you don't know where you're coming from, you don't know where you're going. Exactly. And so would you say that these insights or studying history or going to South Africa, yeah. would you say that these insights are important for future leadership and entrepreneurship? Definitely. They're very important for future leadership and they're very important for entrepreneurship. And I would speak a little bit about untold stories okay. because I felt that our political system in Nigeria is very opaque and it's very it's very difficult for people to really understand what's the difference between a senator, a governor, a lawmaker, an executive. How do people get involved? How do they end up in these parties? How did the APC come about? And these things affect our everyday lives. And so I wanted to demystify mm -hmm. like this segment of society that impacts all of us. Because if we want to understand our policy or our policy makers themselves, then we wow. must understand them as people. And when it comes to leadership, there are very many different ways to be a leader. 
a lot of people feel that they need to lead from the front. They need to be the most obvious. But for me, in studying history, I learned that leadership itself is a tactical game, right? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about the Montgomery bus boycott, for example, in America, is women who made that boycott last as long as it did because they were the ushers in church. They did the food, they did the logistics. A protest is not that you wake up one day and you print a poster and you show up somewhere. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. And for me, it shows the value of having incredible leaders who don't need to hug the spotlight, who don't need to be the loudest in the room, who don't need to write their names in history, but instead, right their impact in our history and our lives. And we have so many examples of that in Nigeria. A lot of people know Adetokunba Ademola, but a lot of people might not recognize that Kofu Ademola was the first black woman to get a degree from Oxford. Oh, wow. That her autobiography changed the view of how people looked at the intelligence of a black woman or an African woman. And this is somebody who was okay to be known as Lady Ademola, but still made her own personal impact in history. Wow. So for me, leadership sometimes, it should, especially in our environment, it doesn't necessarily have to be the loudest person in the room or the one in front of the camera, but it does require a lot of background work. And with my podcast, I try and highlight those little known stories or these personal anecdotes that let us understand the work that goes on behind the scenes. Wow. So Adesla had said something really remarkable. And I say this quite often, that as a leader or as an entrepreneur, understand that there are three ways you can earn. You can earn impact, you can earn influence, and you can earn income. Adesla just told the story of Lady Kofo Ademola, Who's the first, did you say Nigerian? Or no, black she's woman? the first black woman. Black woman to graduate from Oxford University. And I find that these stories are inspiring. So I'm starting to see. So before our conversation, Adiswa, I know that it is very important that yeah. history, you glean from history to yes. move forward. Yeah. First off, so you don't make the same mistakes, mm. you know. But hearing this from you, this is such an inspirational story. And younger women and girls need to know has been done before Definitely. and it can still be done. So tell us more. I want to hear stories about the Dirty Lie podcast. I'm very intrigued by that name. Mm. Why is it a Dirty Lie? What have you unraveled? Okay. So the one of the main reasons I, I called it the Dirty Lie podcast is because when I was in school, we spent a year, I did a special program on immersive history. And we spent a year learning about some of the most brilliant minds I've ever come across talking about the master narrative of history. As mm -hmm. we often say the victors write the stories, but there's also a certain way that stories are written and they're people and or peoples whose stories become anecdotal to what the master narrative is. And sometimes it is a dirty lie, right? If somebody mm -hmm. comes here and says that we were as a people unintelligent or unorganized. And then you find out that there were streetlights in Benin City before there were streetlights in London. That has you to, yes, <laughs> yes. It, it, it causes you to reflect on what is the dirty lie they're telling here. And not just the dirty lie in terms of these little minute details, but the dirty lie is what it says about what we're capable as, as women, or we're capable as, as Nigerians, or as Africans. So for me, when we first came up with the name The Dirty Lie, it's also supposed to be an easy way to access these stories. There's two truths and a dirty lie. You guess which one is true, you guess which one is a lie. And it's a bite-sized, very conversational way to learn history that you don't have to, you don't have to be like me, who's a historian. I can't go and read 15 books on a topic, but you, but it's an easy way to just learn these, you know, little bits of information. Wow. So how would you say studying history mm -hmm. and then the practical, you know, experience of history has shaped your perspective about our, you know, social political scene in Nigeria? It's so funny now. I remember when I said I was going to study history, my dad was completely dismayed. And <laughs> he was waiting for a lawyer daughter, which I eventually became, but he was just like, huh, what are you going to do with a history degree? And it has shaped my whole life, has shaped my complete outlook of life. Sometimes when things, one thing I always say that anything worth doing is probably going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. And every single privilege we enjoy today was hard won 
and hard mm. fought for. And those people who fought for it and their stories carries me along every little thing. So mm. someone, for example, like Hajia Gambo Sawaba, who is often called the most, um, she's called the most arrested female politician in Nigeria. This is a woman who couldn't finish primary school and was married off at the age of 13, but was fighting for the franchisement of Northern women. Because women in Northern Nigeria could not vote for 20 years after women in the South were already in the Senate. And even just that, having that contextual understanding allows me to understand why some areas might be more conservative than the other, how you, you know, communicate with people from different areas. There's an idea of women supporting women when it comes to businesses and, you know, so women being in certain spaces. Hajiya Saoba came down to learn from, from Naira and Sonkuti in Abelkuta. They were having conversations with the women who did, you know, in, in the East as well. And it talks about how our mutual our mutual growth is also us relying on each other and relying on each other's strengths and helping each other where we are weak. Because even though Hajia was on the streets leading protests, Wala Eshon, who was a senator for the Western region, was in the Senate speaking out, speaking up against her Northern colleagues who were not allowing Northern women the right to vote, which means that they were relying on each other's different collective strengths to go towards the same goal. And so when we talk about the importance of applying that to life, it shows me that anything we want to get done, Hadija Saba, they used broken bottle to barb her head. They threw oh, wow. her in prison. They beat her up. By the time she died, she barely had any teeth left because oh, wow. it's a hard Uh, There's personal sacrifice in order to reach a collective good. And so sometimes we want it to come easy. We want success to come easy. We think we follow a certain part, if we're polite, or if we work in a certain way, then everything that we want will come to us. But we must understand that even where we're starting from today, our starting point today was not easily got by the women who came before us. So for me, I would say that that is one thing (laughs) <laughs> that I get a lot from the dirty lies, just understanding that even even driving a car or, you know, being able to go out by myself or go to school or to graduate is not something that came about easy for the women who came before me. And mm-hmm. also the benefit of collective action and also relying on understanding where you are weak and seeing where somebody else is strong and you guys working together. I think it would help anyone. Thank you so much. We're going to take a short break now. When we come back, we'll continue to speak to Miss Adeswa Giwa Osage. So much more to glean from this episode. Wow, Adeswa. Ladies, street lights in Benin City before there were street lights on the streets of London. That is the truth. It's not a dirty lie. And so these sort of stories begin to tell you what we are capable of as Nigerians and as Africans. And then we now talk about the lady, Hajia, I forget her name. Um, Gambo Sawaba. Gambo Sawaba. What I want you to understand, speaking about um, history, ladies, is we have seen how in the past partnerships helped drive growth. Hajia Sawaba came from the north to the south to learn from Fumilayo Ransom Kuti. Hajia Sawaba was married off at the age of 13. She fought for the Northern women to have a voice. They couldn't vote for 20 years after women in the south could vote. We hear these stories, it talks about resilience. It talks about the power of partnerships. We hear every day how women do not support women. And so history definitely is important. If it is the softer side of things and not necessarily technical business skills, which I, I'm sure history has a lot to tell us yeah. about that. I want to hear more, Adiswa, but let's sort of distill and drive it to entrepreneurship and leadership today. Let's talk about entrepreneurship. And I want you to come from the standpoint of integrity. How do you feel these historical narratives mm. have helped and can help because a major problem in entrepreneurship today is integrity. How do you think historical perspectives or narratives can help, you know, uphold that? I think what I would say about when it comes to integrity is the importance of a lasting legacy. 
And when it comes to entrepreneurship, I would talk about possibly um, Bele Wura, the head of mm. the market women in Lagos, who Herbert Macaulay would not have probably been able to reach half of his successes without the support of the market women in Lagos. Wow. When it comes to even our independence, a lot of it, people talk about the Abba women's riots, but a lot of um, historians would call it the women's war uh, more properly because, and it, or the women's protest. But it talks about collective action when women became more economically empowered, especially because during the Second World War, a lot of Nigerian men were taken abroad as servicemen or cooks or chefs or stewards. Then, then they became this push to tax Nigerian women. And women in different areas of the country, you know, came together. But I would say one of our strongest economic or entrepreneurial blocks was actually market women. Mm. You know, they were very, very intelligent. They were able to call their communities together. They were able to grow. They were able to support their communities. And they had the burdens of both being with a lot of men away. A lot of them were working on the farms, selling in the markets and in charge of their households. And so when you think about the capacity of a woman, because a lot of times there is also this question of what, what, what are we going to give up in order to get one thing? Mm. Do I have to, if I, if I want to be a strong businesswoman, do I have to give up some of my family goals? Do I have to give up my goals of being a wife or a mother? And there are some people who have done it before, but they did not do it alone. The best network you can have is of other women. Did you hear that, ladies? The best network you can have is of other women. Okay, so this makes me think. A lot of the times, even as an entrepreneur myself, I feel as though the government policies or policies, policies at large are far removed mm -hmm. from true entrepreneurial life and journey. Yeah. So would you say that if we came together as entrepreneurs, let's call it collective action of today, yeah. that we could actually shape policy? 100%. I want to dwell on policy. Yes. Speak to the ladies. Tell the ladies the importance of policy and of getting involved. Mm. I think every Nigerian entrepreneur understands the effect of policy on their everyday lives because of the forex um, infl fluxes we've That's been the seeing. One they can because to. of the price of petrol, because of how much it is to clear goods at the port, mm -hmm. because of how much VAT is. And these are all policy decisions. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a seat in the table, then you don't have a voice in where we're going. Mm -hmm. And right now, especially, I would say in this administration, we do have some women representation, but a lot of it is in selected roles. It's mm -hmm. a special advisor or a special assistant, or even a minister, that's a selective role. They serve at the pleasure of the president. Mm -hmm. We have less legislative representation right now in Nigeria. And I think in my whole lifetime, there's three times less women senators than we have now than we had in the last Senate body. I think we have three or four. So I know we have Natasha Akwoti. I know we have Iriti Kingiwe. I think there might be one more woman senator. I'm not entirely sure. But before we had nine. It's a ser serious issue if the number of senators now are really is nearly the same as the number it was in 1950s, right? This should be something that as women and as women entrepreneurs, we should be making a lot of noise about. And it's not just our legislative bodies. Obviously, we do not have a single woman governor. If we look at our state house of assemblies, the number of women is quite low. And then you now look at the commissioners of finance. You know, you need to look at who who holds, the, who makes these policy decisions. But I want to say that it's not limited to just people who are elected and selected. There's something that we can do within ourselves. One is collective action. Two is actually active citizenry. Because you can today write any House of Reps member, you can gather yourself, you can gather a group of people to tackle certain legislation or tackle certain laws that you have a problem with. I previously had a huge problem with Section 241 of the Cybercrimes Act. 
and I mm. actively lobbied. Now the section 24 one has now been amended and it has been um, assented by the president. But for me, that a huge issue with that law, one, I used it to highlight the case of Chioma Okoli, the young mother. I saw that documentary. Yes. Ladies, if you haven't watched the story of Chioma Okoli, um, I think we have to put the link on our Transform Her website. I just thought that was a brilliant documentary. Thank you. But for me also, it went beyond that because that law was being uh -huh. used to oppress people because of how it was worded. It was a, for me, I was like, this is the law I'm going to face. And I was able to do so. Everyone within their capacity as a Nigerian citizen can, but more so women groups and women entrepreneurs, if you're like the price of, the, if they increase VAT, this is going to significantly hurt my business. Then you have to, within yourselves, form a lobby group. You have to, within yourselves, hit up your House of Reps member or protest to your governor or message, you know, whatever is within your power to do, you can as a citizen, even as an individual, but more powerfully as a group. And these different, right now, the uh, former senator in the Senate, she's no longer a senator, but um, Senator Olu, um, Olubumi from Ikiti, she tried to find, um, tried to pass a women's equity bill in the Senate and it failed. Now she's no longer in the Senate. So that equity bill is just sitting there. That's something that as women, we can collectively come to say that we need our rights protected within our country and we want this bill passed. And we mm. do have women in the Senate that can do that. In the House of Reps, Honorable Kafilat is the chair, I believe, of women's um, issues in, in the House of Reps. And the House has taken up steps saying that they want to look at some sort of women's equity bill. This is something that women's groups and us women as individuals should be paying attention to. Because those laws matter and those policies affect us beyond just diesel and petrol and tax and forex. As women, are our rights protected. In Nigeria, we often talk about the issue of single women trying to rent homes. Do we have renters protection? Do we have specific gender protection for single women who are no longer, who are not allowed to rent in a lot of places? We go now, they say they don't want a single woman to live here. Those things can be prevented by policy. They can, we can be protected by law. So I think policy is very, very important and we need more active participation. Mm. Pick up a party card, you know, pick up a picket or write a letter or write an amendment. There's so many Nigerian women who are lawyers, who are brilliant lawyers, mm. who can take it upon themselves to look at our laws and work towards gender parity. Wow. If we had four episodes, we will not be done talking to Adeswa. She said something about active citizenry. Let's use our soft power women to ensure that women's rights are upheld. Transform Her is not a feminist movement. It's a movement that highlights and shows us ways that we can grow as women. And so one of the things that Iswa has spoken about and advised is that you need your network and your community for growth, okay? They often tell us as women that in our growth, one aspect of our lives has to suffer. So if you want to raise a family, your entrepreneurship or your career will suffer. If you want to do that, raising a family, your children will not be well raised. That is not true. If you have that community of network or network of women who can help you grow and remain resilient, it is possible. A major takeout for me in this episode is the fact that we can no longer sit on the fence. We have to be the change that we want to see. History is there to show. Adeswa has highlighted, called so many. Oh my God. I mean, this was history lesson <laughs> 101 to 105 or beyond for me. And I really thank you for coming on board. But ladies, let us sit and understand that for tremendous growth, for equity, for inclusion, we as women must come together, form these networks, lobby groups, and take action actionable steps. Remember, when you're running a business outside of income, you can earn impact and influence. And the way women like Lady Kofo Ademola paved the way for you and I, we should not forget the generation yet unborn. It's been a pleasure. Adeswa, thank you. Thank you I'm so much. I'm going to bring much. you back. You have to come back. Give <laughs> us more on so history. Much.
Ladies, please stay tuned for our next segment, which is our coaching segment on Transform Her. Welcome to today's coaching episode on Transform Her. We're still on the topic of personal branding, crafting and creating a strong personal brand as a leader. In the previous episodes, we were discussing in detail the five attributes of a strong personal brand. One of these attributes is that the brand must be communicated. And these are the things to consider in communicating your brand. Who is or are your target audience? Who are you trying to communicate and engage with? Where would you find them? And most importantly, what communication channels and how will you communicate with them? For instance, social media is a very powerful tool. But even in the field of social media, is it Instagram? Is it LinkedIn? Is it Twitter? Where does your target audience play? We call it their playground. The next thing is consistency. This is another attribute of a strong personal brand. It means that you have to be reliable. Your brand communication has to be uniform across communication channels. So the media will is 360. It could be on air as I'm communicating with you now. On air could be TV or radio. It could be print. It could be social. It could be digital media. But across board, even though they're different formats, your brand communication and message should be uniform. You must be dependable. Your target audience must be sure that they can depend on your brand for what you promise to deliver. And there must be continuity. So you don't draw people in and attract them and then just let them loose. The way to build a strong personal brand is to continue delivering that promise over a period of time. Finally, you must have the ability to evolve. With the rapidly changing face of everything, media, the online world, and the world at large, you do not want to become a dinosaur. As a brand, you must be dynamic. You must have adaptable capacity so that you can adapt to the changing trends. You must also be flexible. Do not be rigid. There might be a need to change how it is you communicate, what you are communicating without losing the essence of the brand. This is what helps you grow as a brand and ensure progression in communicating that strong and powerful personal brand. Never forget, a brand is a promise kept. Until next time, it's been great hosting you on this episode. Goodbye.